This is VOA Africa. Good evening. I'm Esther Githu. You are it's Tuesday, November 12th. This is Africa 54. Sudanese criticize economic conditions as the government says it needs $5 billion in support. How transracial adoptees develop identity and sense of self. And raising awareness and dispelling myths about epilepsy. A World Bank report in April 2019 projected Sudan's gross domestic product to grow by 3.1 percent. And although the oil sector had driven much of Sudan's economic growth since 1999, recent political upheavals have taken a toll on the country's economy. Sudan now needs up to $5 billion in budget support to avert an economic collapse and launch reforms after the ouster of longtime ruler Omar al-Bashir. Serena Chandri reports. Sudan says it needs up to $5 billion in foreign aid to avert economic collapse and launch reforms. This follows months of protests over price hikes for fuel and bread, which triggered the uprising that led to the ouster of veteran ruler Omar al-Bashir. Finance Minister Ibrahim al-Badawi told Reuters the country has only enough foreign currency reserves to fund imports for a few weeks. You know, we will do our part, but we cannot do it alone. Uh, for, 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 the, for this government to succeed, for this revolution uh, to proceed into a stable democracy uh, in this, uh, in this you know, very, very critical part of Africa and the Middle East, uh, we, we need understanding and the support, and I'm quite certain we will get it. Sudan has been in crisis since losing most of its oil wealth with South Sudan's secession in 2011. 65% of the population live in poverty. Prices for even basic foods like bread remain high, and most people say they have to work twice as hard to cope with soaring market prices. I expected that the government, once people took to the streets and the youth took to the streets, we hoped that things would change. The situation is worse. People are standing in line for bread to eat lunch. They can't find any. The civilian government formed in August to steer the country through transition says the funding is a lifeline and would be used to set up a social support network that would allow fuel and wheat subsidies to be lifted next year. al Badawi said it has already drawn slightly more than half of the $3 billion offered by Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates. Serena Chandri of Reuters with that report. Zimbabweans finally got access to new low denomination currency on Tuesday, which authorities hope will end chronic cash shortages in the Southern African nation. Some media reports say many customers were still frustrated as banks maintained an existing weekly withdrawal limit of $20. The new two and five Zimbabwe dollars notes and coins were scheduled to start circulating on Monday but failed to appear on time, causing confusion at banks. Shortages of cash, foreign currency and fuel and power are the most visible signs of Zimbabwe's worst economic crisis since 2008 when hyperinflation forced the government to ditch its currency. Hundreds of people, mostly pensioners, lined up for cash outside one bank in central Harare on Tuesday and were issued 150 Zimbabwe dollars of the new $2 bills and coins. They were told to return on Thursday if they wanted to withdraw more of the new bank notes. Central Bank Governor John Magundia was quoted in the government-owned Herald newspaper saying the Reserve Bank of Zimbabwe had disbursed 30 million Zimbabwe dollars in new notes to banks. Canadian gold miner Semafo says it will not resume operations at its Bongo mine in Burkina Faso until security in the area is assured following last week's deadly ambush on a road to the site. At least 39 people were killed in the attack on the Semafo convoy last Wednesday, the latest in a series of high-profile actions in the country plagued by jihadist violence. A total of 241 employees, contractors and suppliers were caught up in the attack. 
that also wounded 60 others. The company suspended operations after the violence, which occurred about 40 kilometers from Bongo. One semaphore worker who was, one of, who was in one of the buses that was attacked leaving the mine on November 6 said two of the five buses that were shot at by the assailants with machine guns managed to get away, but the rest were locked down, forcing his bus driver, who was shot dead, to lose control of the bus. South African Airways says it could cut more than 900 jobs as it tries to restructure to, st to stem severe financial losses. The state-owned airline has not made an annual profit since 2011. It's also battling severe funding difficulties and an inefficient and aging fleet of airplanes. In a statement, South African Airways said it had started talks with more than 5,000 staff and was consulting labor unions. South African officials have been searching for an investor to take a stake in the airline, but efforts have so far been unsuccessful. President Cyril Ramaphosa said in October the carrier was in talks with potential partners. Once a symbol of patriotic pride, South Africa Airways has become a source of frustration for taxpayers, losing its shine against other African carriers like Ethiopian Airlines, which now is Africa's biggest. Staying in South Africa, from a network of blankets strung together under a bridge in Cape Town, a group of homeless transgender sex workers are fighting for equality. Lucy Fielder reports. From a network of blankets strung together under a bridge in Cape Town, a growing voice is emerging. These are the sisters of the castle, a group of around 40 homeless transgender sex workers. We don't ask for a castle, we don't ask for cars, we don't ask for money, just to have home. South Africa was the first country in the world to ban discrimination based on sexual orientation and is the only African nation to allow same-sex marriage. But transgender activists say their community has been forgotten and sisters like Louise Oliver are refusing to be left behind. We're sick and tired of being here where we are. We are, we want to go and have a life, get a job, be ourselves, and on our two feet. I don't want to get on the age of 40, 45, and still here. They're credited with success for the trans community, including motivating a major court ruling on transgender prison rights. But a core issue is a lack of affordable housing that limits their options, making it difficult for them to earn a living any way other than sex work. Though that doesn't mean Oliver is ashamed of her job. You get options here yeah, of getting, giving sex, trading for money. What are you going to do? You don't have no choice but to do it. They say doing sex work is it's, it's bad. But for me, I'm proud to say I'm a sex worker. My body pays my balls and it to provide me. Though a homeless shelter that opened last year does have transgender space, the sisters, members of the community, who were labelled men at birth but identify as women, say they are usually assigned to male dormitories. There, according to one member of the group, men always want sexual favours. Many end up living in the makeshift shelters where they are vulnerable to being robbed, attacked or having their homes dismantled by law enforcement agencies. The sisters' cause got some profile in August, in a magazine highlighting their stories and advocacy. 1,500 copies were sold in Cape Town, New York and Amsterdam. And Oliver is happy that people can see the lifestyle they are living and the struggles they face. Lucy Field of Reuters reporting. French President Emmanuel Macron opened second Paris Peace Forum on Tuesday with a plea for delegates, including several dozen heads of state and government, to find practical solutions to the world problems, saying their populations were watching. The first Peace Forum gathering international leaders and NGOs took place after commemorations in Paris to mark the centenary of the end of World War I in 2018. Speaking during the forum, the French leader admitted the challenge for the meeting was to keep up the momentum. 
November is National Adoption Month in the U.S. and more than 130,000 children join U.S. families every year through domestic and foreign adoptions because black youngsters are disproportionately represented in the child welfare system and are often adopted into white families. VOA has taken a closer look at the experiences. Reporter Claire Maureen Jibog continues our multi-part series with the story of Chad Gola, Sojourner, who grew up uncomfortably in his own black skin despite the loving support of his adoptive white parents. He felt isolated in largely white Tacoma, a port city in the northwestern U.S. state of Washington. But he used that sense of alienation as a tool to build a healthy racial identity, both in coaching other transracial adoptive families and in his performance art. Chad Goller Sojourner was adopted at 13 months by a family in Tacoma in the northwestern U.S. state of Washington. His parents are white. He, his brother and sister, are not. He felt a big disconnect between his white upbringing and how he felt perceived by others. I was this black boy who didn't want to be black. Um, from an identity standpoint, I identified with the people around me. You know, with trans voice adoptees, your first, your first identification is that of your surroundings. Black people scared me. And since I wasn't a fan of being scared, I would do my best to avoid them at all times possible. Chad's show makes it clear that he wasn't comfortable in exclusively white or black worlds. Now 46, he has turned that discomfort into performance art. I would be shy of 25 before I could hear rap music and not think something bad was about to go down. <laughs> After years of grappling with identity issues and stigma, Chad decided to become a coach for transracial adoptive families. I firmly believe um, that as transracial parents, that they have a duty to prepare their child, not just for the world they live in, but most importantly for the world that they'll age into. April and Andrew Rauch adopted two black children, Ophelia and Guion, before getting pregnant with Henrik. I thought that we were prepared to parent children of color, but I remember that the very first thing that really rocked our world was Trayvon Martin. Because I remember that photo that was released of him in his hoodie that looked so much like you, and we took you kids to the march here in Seattle. And that just rocked my world. That could have been you guys. 17-year-old Trayvon Martin was shot dead one evening in 2012 as he walked to his father's home in central Florida. The shooter, a neighborhood watch captain, was acquitted of a second-degree murder charge. Trayvon's case sparked nationwide rallies for racial justice. Are you worried about your brother? Yeah. I just don't want him to get hurt because of the way he looks because he's my brother. Chad also wanted to know more about his biological family. A few years ago, he finally tracked down his birth mother's sister. She sent him a portfolio about his birth mom, Yolandia Maria Hurt. She was an actress and had died in 2011. It was very interesting to see for the first time at 44, somebody who looked like me, and then to end up in the same profession as she did, um, was just crazy, you know. His birth mother's memorabilia helped Chad better understand his identity. Now, when counseling adoptive families, he emphasizes the need to preserve ties to a child's pre-adoption life. A lot of people forget that adoptees have a story before they come to you. Whatever it is that we have our own story, and this was my story, to know that I could, like, run my fingers over here, and I mean, although she's deceased, I'm actually touching my mother, not metaphorically, but really. And so certainly that is something beyond what I ever thought possible. Join us again Wednesday when Claire Maureen Jibog brings you a story of a white suburban mom who adopted three black children and the uncomfortable lessons she learned about how race affects perceptions. And for more on this series, visit us online at voanews.com. We're excited to hear what you think about Africa 54. Join the discussion on Facebook. The address is Africa 54. We're also streaming our broadcast live on Facebook.
please watch and share our show with your friends. Also, check out our headlines 24-7 on voaafrica.com. Still to come, a closer look at epilepsy. We'll be back. Sheikh Asali, host and senior editor of VOA's international calling talk show, Straight Talk Africa. Today we'll examine the tobacco industry. We'll pretty much touch on anything that you can think of. Politics, health issues, human rights issues, you name it, we talk about it. The issues that we discuss are pertinent to most people on the African continent. A very, very rare and unique opportunity to interact with their leaders. French, English, Portuguese, Bantu, Arabic, it is the beat, the African beat that counts, the beat does all the translations, it cuts across all languages and gives us the understanding that this is the African beat, it is so distinct and adhesive, it binds us together, African beat on the voice of America, for more information visit our website at www.voanews.com slash African beat. I'm Clara Frank, and here's what's trending. The makers of a South African gin infused with elephant dung say their use of the animal's excrement is no gimmick. The creators of Indlovu gin stumbled across the idea a year ago after learning that elephants eat a variety of fruits and flowers, but only digest less than a third of it. They describe the gin's flavor as one that changes subtly with the seasons and location. A bottle of the gin sells for around 500 rand, or about $32. It's proven to be a hit with tourists seeking a unique souvenir and a story to tell when they return home. Next up, after 24 hours of frenzied buying and selling and weeks of aggressive advertising and promotions before it, the Alibaba group said its sales hit another record high on Singles Day the biggest shopping day on the planet. The Chinese e-commerce giant said its platform sold goods worth $38.4 billion, easily exceeding last year's record of $30.7 billion. Electronics gadgets and fashion items were among the most sold goods. And finally, the next adventure in the Star Wars movie and TV franchise, arriving November 12th on Walt Disney Company's new streaming service, takes place on a lawless planet at the outer reaches of the galaxy. The Mandalorian, an eight-episode live-action series, stars Game of Thrones actor Pedro Pascal as a helmeted bounty hunter. It will be available on Disney+, Plus, a new $7 per month online subscription meant to compete with Netflix. Disney will release the first episode on Tuesday and the second Friday, followed by one installment each Friday after that. And that's what's trending today. Democratic lawmakers in the U.S. House of Representatives are taking their impeachment case against President Donald Trump to the public Wednesday with open televised hearings. The public hearings are targeting Trump for allegedly abusing his office for his personal political gain. Until now, the investigation has taken place behind closed doors with information coming only out of transcripts and news reports. An American University political science and communications professor believes the hearings will get a lot of attention. People will watch, they will see excerpts, they will follow it, they want to know what everybody else is talking about in the country. So I do think it will capture a lot of the attention of the American people. House members are exploring whether Trump violated his oath of office by asking Ukraine to investigate political rival Joe Biden and his son Hunter, while all along withholding military aid to the Ukraine. A European ally, Trump, for weeks has denied that his late July telephone call with Ukraine's president amounted to a quid pro quo, the military aid in exchange for an investigation of the Bidens. The first witnesses this week include three State Department diplomats who have provided corroboration, corroborating accounts of the administration's actions 
Republicans want to hear from others, including Hunter Biden and the anonymous whistleblower who sparked the inquiry, but Democrats are unlikely to agree. It's time for our health report, and joining us now is our health reporter, Lino Mudu. Hello, Lino. Hello, Esther. Hello, everyone. Uh, researchers in the United Kingdom say a measles infection can zap the immune system's memory, putting people at risk all over again for diseases they already had, like chickenpox. VOA's Arash Arabdasi looks at the lab where scientists made the discovery. New studies show a devastating and highly contagious disease causes even more harm than previously thought. For a period of perhaps five years after infection, individuals who catch measles, not have the vaccine, but catch natural measles, develop this state where they're much more susceptible to infection, and they even seem to be able to catch things that they'd previously become immune to. Scientists call it immune amnesia, and they say it opens the potentially life-threatening door for the unvaccinated. If you live in a community where there are more people who experience measles or who don't vaccinate, you are more likely to get other infections because there will be more people susceptible. Dr. Velislava Petrova is an immunologist and lead author at the Welcome Sanger Institute in Britain. Scientists here specialize in genetics. For the first time, we could use a technique that allows us to read the genes that the immune system uses to produce antibodies and be able to track specific immune cells before and after infection in order to find out what happens to them after measles. What they found was worse than expected. It's not just immune amnesia, but a hampered ability to respond to new diseases. After measles, up to five years, people are, um, have increased rate of other infections with other pathogens, which shows that there is an effect that we can observe on a population level. Measles is one of the world's most contagious viruses. It can leave children with brain damage or hearing loss. The CDC says infections are at a 25-year high amid an anti-vaccination movement based upon unproven fears about the safety of vaccines themselves. Arash Arabasadi, VOA News, Washington. November is Epilepsy Awareness Month in the United States, a time dedicated to spotlight epilepsy and raise awareness and support. Epilepsy is one of the most common neurological diseases in the world. The condition affects about 65 million people worldwide, according to the World Health Organization. And people who suffer from epilepsy have recurrent seizures, sudden uncontrolled electrical disturbance in the brain. Seizures can affect a part of the body, partial seizures, or the entire body, generalized seizures. According to the WHO, nearly 80% of people with epilepsy live in low- and middle-income countries. However, three-quarters of them are not getting the treatment they need. Now, joining us in the studio for more on epilepsy is Dr. Steve Owens, Vice President of Programs and Services with the Epilepsy Foundation. Dr. Owens, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. Help us understand epilepsy and what causes it. Well, epilepsy, it can be caused by a congenital, what we mean when someone is born, when a baby is being formed, but also by traumatic injury to the head or to the brain. But it most often, globally, is caused by a parasite called neurocystis sarcosis. Okay. So those are the main things that causes epilepsy. Now, seizures is very much a part of uh, epilepsy. Mm -hmm. What causes seizures? Are there some triggers? Well, we really don't know what causes seizures, but yes, there are triggers that can make someone have a seizure. Triggers such as in the United States missing their medications, but also not getting enough sleep. Um, stress can also cause um, seizures, but also uh, alcohol is also another thing that can cause seizures. But in general, when someone is diagnosed with epilepsy, we want to make sure that they take their medicines, that they get enough rest, and they get enough sleep, and try to be in environments that are not stressful because they can trigger seizures. Now, let me ask you this. Uh, when someone is having a seizure and mm -hmm. people are around, what should they, what should they do? Well, it really depends on the type of seizures they're having. 
if it's the, uh, but there are three things that you can do regardless of what type of procedure the person hired to be. We have three things to remember, stay safe side. So stay with the person, make sure that they are not going to harm themselves. So you want to stay with the person, but immediately start timing the seizures because most often seizures last less than three minutes or so. So if the seizure, once you start timing it, you want to keep the person, you want to stay with the person, call for help. And you want to turn the person um, on their side. So that's in order to keep any type of fluid, if they're having the convulsive type seizures, from draining uh, and, and choking on there. We do not want anyone to put anything in their mouth. Do not, that mean a spoon or bottle or anything, because that's a myth. You, a person cannot swallow their tongue. Yes, and yeah. speaking of myth, there are... There are several myths around epilepsy. One such myth is the fact that it may be contagious through saliva. Uh, talk mm. to us about that. Well, epilepsy is not contagious. And also, a person is not possessed, because in, in many religious settings, they think someone Absolutely. may be possessed by a demon. But it's not contagious. People with epilepsy, we think that um, the public may think that they're slow, but they have normal intelligence. That's another myth. It's not contagious. It can't go from one person to the other. You should help someone if you see one having a seizure. Yes. Can yeah. they get involved in uh, physical activities like sports, extreme sports? Yes, but you must um, use what we call common sense, depending on the sport. If your seizures are um, predictable, maybe you can as be in sports that may uh, align with the type of seizure you have. Yeah. But if, if there are other types of sport, we say cons consult your physician. But yes, you can participate in sports. sports. We recommend that you don't swim because you could have a seizure while swimming. Mm -hmm. um, but other sports, basketball, any, you know, anything sports, but it's just to be safe, knowing your seizures, know what triggers your seizures, and make sure you're taking medicines because and there are many people with, yeah. Yes, yes, mm -hmm. and before we wrap, uh, what about collaboration? Your organization is a major one in the U.S. that addresses seizures. Do you collaborate with countries, uh, low- and middle-income countries? What kind of help yes, do you Yes, we uh, uh, work with the International League on Epilepsy and also mm -hmm. the International Bureau on Epilepsy to raise education and awareness to make sure that treatments are available for people living in uh, low- and middle-income countries. Because treatment is definitely not as sexy as I mentioned in the introduction, right. by many people in, in uh, underdeveloped countries. Right, okay. right, yes, and so we always want people to stay and know what may trigger the seizure, decrease stress, get enough sleep, and if they're on medicines, take their medicines. Very good points, Dr. Owens. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks for having me. And that was uh, Dr. Steve Owens. He is Vice President of Programs and Services with the Epilepsy Foundation here in the United States. And that's today's health report. Back to you, Esther. Thank you, Lino. Be sure to watch Lino Modu's health reports every Tuesday on Africa 54. And that's our show for today. Be sure to watch Africa 54 on our website at voaafrica.com. From all of us here in Washington, have a very good evening.